The Men in Toll, Constantine Tolman, N.C. Dun Passé Sans Memoir in Certains Relics. Mysteries d'un Vieux Monde en Mysteries Écrits. Lamartine. Mr. L. T. Blight, F.S.A. Gives the following graphic description of various perforated stones in Cornwall, and elsewhere. In the western part of Cornwall there are several ancient monuments known by the name of Hold Stones. They consist of thin slabs of granite, each being pierced by a round hole, generally near its center. They vary in size and in form. That near the Menscrypha in Madron, better known than others, is placed between, or rather arranged triangularly with, two other upright stones. Other hold stones which have hitherto been noticed are not so accompanied. The late Mr. Buller, in his, Account of the Parish of St. Just, described some such stones which he found near Carn Kennejack. One may still be seen in the vicarage grounds of St. Just, and two others near Balite, in St. Barian. The monument to which I would now more particularly call attention is at Talvin Cross, Talvin is Cornish for Hold Stone, in the parish of St. Constantine, a few yards west of the road from, Week to the Helston and Falmouth Turnpike. Dar. Borlace refers to a hold stone about a mile west of St. Constantine Church. The subject of the present notice is twice that distance from the church, it is therefore uncertain whether or not the doctor alludes to the same monument. It is the largest hold stone in Cornwall, being 8 feet 6 inches high by 8 feet 11 inches wide at the base, diminishing to a point at the summit, thus it is of a triangular form. Its average thickness is about 1 foot. But it is a little thicker at the bottom than at the top. The hole, almost perfectly circular, is 17 inches in diameter. Though within the slate district, the stone is of granite. Formerly it was a conspicuous object by the wayside. But within the last twelve or fourteen years a house has been built betwixt it and the road. It now forms part of a garden hedge. In a field adjoining the opposite side of the road, perhaps eighteen yards from the stone, is a low irregular barrow, about twenty yards in diameter, and studded with small mounds. Dar. Borlase has alluded to the superstitious practice of drawing children through the hold stone at Madron, to cure them of weakness or pains in the back, a practice still observed at the hold stone at St. Constantine. I was told that some remarkable cures had been effected there only a few weeks since. The ceremony consists of passing the child nine times through the hole, alternately from one side to the other. And it is essential to success that the operation should finish on that side where there is a little grassy mound, recently made, on which the patient must sleep, with a sixpence under his head. A trough-like stone, called the cradle, on the eastern side of the barrow, was formerly used for this purpose. This stone, unfortunately, has long been destroyed. That hold stones were not originally constructed for the observance of this peculiar custom is evident, for in some instances the holes are not more than five or six inches in diameter. A few years ago, a person digging close to the Talvin, discovered a pit in which were fragments of pottery, arranged in circular order, the hole being covered by a flat slab of stone. Imagining that he had disturbed some mysterious place, with commendable reverence he immediately filled up the pit again. Taking the proximity of the barrow in connection with the pit, it seems most probable that the Talvin is a sepulchral monument, stones of this kind being erected perhaps to a peculiar class of personages. It is well known that the circle is an ancient symbol of eternity, and it was sometimes adopted as typical of deity itself. The triangular form of the stone may not be accidental. The hold stones at Madron also form part of a triangular arrangement. Whether a significant connection was intended in this union of the circle and the triangle is perhaps worthy of consideration. Though hold stones are sometimes found near what are termed druidic circles, I perceive no traces of monuments of that description near the Talvin. The hold stones at Kennejack, St. Just, are near ancient circles. And the two hold stones at Balite are not more than 100 yards from the well-known stone circle, called Dawn's Mayan. Within the memory of many persons now living, there was to be seen, in the town places of many western villages, an unhewn table-like stone called the Garaxons. 
This stone was the usual meeting place of the villagers, and regarded by them as public property. Old residents in Eskals have often told me of one which stood near the middle of that hamlet on an open space where a maple was also erected. This Garak Zans they described as nearly round, about three feet high, and nine in diameter, with a level top. A bonfire was shade on it and danced around at midsummer. When petty offences were committed by unknown persons, those who wished to prove their innocence, and to discover the guilty, were accustomed to light a first fire on the Garak Zans. Each person who assisted took a stick of fire from the pile, and those who could extinguish the fire in their sticks, by spitting on them, were deemed innocent. If the injured handed a fire stick to any persons, who failed to do so, they were declared guilty. Most evenings young persons, linked hand in hand, danced around the Garak Zans, and many old folks passed round it nine times daily from some notion that it was lucky and good against witchcraft. The stone now known as Tablemen was called the Garak Zans by old people of Senin. If our traditions may be relied on, there was also in Trian a large one, around which a market was held in days of yore, as mentioned at page 77. There was a Garak Zans in Soa only a few years since, and one may still be seen in Roskistel, St. Levon. Nothing, seems to be known respecting their original use. Yet the significant name, and a belief, held by old folks at least, that it is unlucky to remove them, denote that they were regarded as sacred objects. Venerated stones, known by the same name, were long preserved in other villages until removed by strange owners and occupiers, who are, for the most part, regardless of our ancient monuments. Divination by Rushes and Ivy Leaves Many persons, who were anxious to know their future fate with regard to love and marriage, or for mere fun, were in the habit of assembling, on twelfth night, in a farmhouse kitchen, which had a large open fireplace, used for burning furs and turf. A fire was laid that would make plenty of thumers, embers, and hot ashes, such being required for working theses. Then each person touched the cravel, mantle stone, with his or her forehead, and departed in single file and silence, which was required to be observed, until, having gathered the rushes and ivy leaves. They returned and again touched the cravel with their heads. The procession was often waylaid or followed by some who tried to make the spell workers break silence, if any of them spoke they had to return and again touch the cravel. Those who wished to know their own luck in love and marriage, or that of different couples who were said to be sweethearts, placed in the hot ashes and thumers, two pieces of rush, named or intended for the respective parties. If both rushes burned kindly together, those they represented would be married. As the pairs were consumed, united or parted, such would be the course of their love. The one which burnt longest would outlive the other. When it was decided who were to be married together an ivy leaf was cast into the fire, and the number of cracks it made in burning told the years to pass before the couple would be wed. Then two leaves for the wedded pair were buried in the hot ashes, and the cracks they made showed how many children the happy couple would be blessed with. Other presages, which afforded much amusement, were drawn from the appearance and behavior of rushes and ivy leaves, or lovers and married folks, in their fiery bed. Meanwhile old people, who in general were the most anxious to know if they or others were destined to live or die during the ensuing year, drew an ivy leaf for each person, either named or thought of, through a gold ring, and cast the leaves into a vessel of spring water, which was placed on the hearthstone and left there overnight. Next morning, the leaves that were found to have turned black or to be specked with reds is like blood, showed that those black, whom the were intended would for dead air next twelfth night. The blood spots betokened a violent end. Recent ill wishing. The following case of a ill wished woman, living in, was told me a few days since by one of her neighbors. In the autumn of 1870, a pilot, or one of a pilot's crew, that my informant called a hobbler, gained upwards of twenty pounds for his share of the hobble, or pilotage of a ship, which was only one night's work. Next morning, whilst the hobbler was in bed, his wife, elated with her husband's good luck, stood outside her door when the neighboring women were passing by to the spring for water, and she was saying to a number of them, who gathered around her, 
how lucky it was that her husband had met with such a good hobble, just in time for her to pay off old scores at the shops. And to enable her to get a little comfortable winter's clothing for her husband and children before cold weather came. In her joy at the godsend, she continued a long time detailing her plans for disposing of it to the best advantage, and was about to go in as the women took up their pitchers, when another hobbler's wife, who had been listening for some time, turned round, in taking up her vessel of water, and said, The art ready to burst with pride because good luck yes come to thy door, but I wish to God that thee mayst never be the better for it. Saying this she departed. The pilot's wife, a moment before full of gladness was now, struck all of a heap. Cold shivers passed through her. As she fell on the form she said that no good would now come to her from the begrudged money, and that the ill-wish had taken effect. From that day to this she has never been like the same woman, she has lost all heart to struggle for her family. When her husband is at sea she fears he will no more return, and believes something evil is constantly hanging over her head yet she can't be said to have any known bodily ailment. The doctor told her he didn't know what to give her, nor what could be amiss with her, unless she was bewitched, so my informant said. She had also sought aid of the Peller, or White Wizard, who visits the district at stated times, and even he had to give her up. In answer to my inquiry if the woman that ill-wished the hobbler's wife was a witch, she replied, no, not that the neighbors knew of, and they supposed she didn't altogether mean to do the harm she did. But it so happened that the bad words passed her lips at the fatal minute when ill wishes won't fall to the ground. Some call her a witch now, but they don't think her one, she's too big a fool. After a pause, as if to settle the matter, she added, no, on the whole, I don't think she's anything better or worse than the general run of women. I have known her all my lifetime, she was a professor for years. We used to meet in the same class till she got married, when she left off, because she couldn't afford then, with a family coming quick, to pay class money every week, ticket money and preacher's money every quarter, and give to all the collections. As EDES expected of members, however poor they may be, it was busy all to make both ends meet. No more could she then spare time to go to preaching, or other means of grace, every night is the week, like she did in her courting days, besides she was a very wicked talking woman, and said worse than she meant. She would rap out an oath like nothing it eased her mind she said, if anybody, thirded, crossed, her. Like other backsliders she was worse than anyone that had always been, carnal minded. Class leaders, and others, of, the people, tried all they could do, by talking to her, to get her in the right way again, when her husband was in good getting they even prayed for her in the meetings, and it made her worse than ever to be told that. She said, in her sinful way, they had better leave her alone, for she knew they were no better than a set of duffins, and backbiting and undermining hypocrites. That all they wanted of her was money, money all the time, and if one hadn't plenty of that for them, they wouldn't so much as dip the tip of their finger in water to save a poor soul from perishing. Pinching hard times made her spiteful, for there's nothing so bad as poverty to make one feel ugly. As for the poor ill-wished woman, she never had half enough of the old one in her to help her stand up in her own defense. We give another out of many recent instances of ill-wishing. The other day a small farmer, living in the higher side of Madron Parish, came in to a surgeon, in this town, and told him that his wife was very bad in bed. And that neither he nor any of the neighbors could make out what was amiss with her unless she was ill-wished by a woman, who lived on the downs why near his dwelling, or else overlooked, by her evil eyes. His wife objected to borrow or lend with her, above all to lend. And good reason why, said the man, for she never paid what she borrowed. A month or so ago she wanted sixpence of my woman to clear scores with a, Johnny Fortnight, Pac-Man, my wife refused her. On leaving our door she scraped her feet on the trussel, then turned round, shaked her finger at my wife, and said, See if I don't make thee wish, the longest day thee hast got to live, that thee hadst never denied me anything. My poor dear had to take to her bed next day, and she haunt been much out of it since. Do come and see her as quick as you can. In answer to the surgeon's questions, the farmer told him she wasn't what one could call heart-sick. But there was no, sprawl, energy, 
in her, and her bowels were never in a right state. The surgeon gave him medicine for his wife, and promised to see her shortly. A few days after, having to visit a patient who lived near the ailing farmer's wife, he called to see her also. The husband, who was in great stroth, and all of a stroll, molly coddling about the household work, told the doctor that his wife was still in bed, no better for the medicine that he could see, and showed him upstairs to her room. Where he found a big fat woman, sleeping soundly. When awoke, she described her ailment just as her husband had stated, dwelling much on her bad appetite, the weakness she felt all over, and her having no heart to do anything. The doctor noticed, all about the chamber, a number of bottles and teacups, with the remains of all sorts of cordials and caudles in them, which showed that she had been nursed to the surfeiting point. Having felt her pulse, examined her tongue, and gone through all the ceremonies usual on such occasions, he shook his head and left the room, followed by the husband, who, with a long face, begged that he might be told the worst. Now don't e be afraid to tell me, said he, for if there is no hopes I can bear to hear it, thank goodness I have done all in my power for her, poor dear, and have nothing on my mind to answer for. Her best chance of being cured depends upon you, I think, said the doctor, with a serious face, if you can make up your mind to undertake a difficult job. Oh, do tell me what I shall do, replied the man, and I will go through fire and water for her, the dear. That's all very easy to say, rejoined the doctor, but it will require all your strength and courage. If you have a wheelbarrow about the place, bring it in, put your wife into it, and trundle her out into the middle of the largest field or croft hereabouts, there leave her, and if she won't come in let her stay there until she's tired. There's no more amiss with your wife than there is with me, except laziness and a diseased fancy, that you have made worse by indulging her whims. You should have been out in the fields about your work, and have left her to do without her coddles till she rose and cooked them. We don't know how the farmer proceeded to execute the doctor's advice, but next market day he called in thanked him for his hint, said his wife was then doing her work, and as well as ever she was in her life. But you had better not venture to see her again soon, said he, for I believe she would as leave meet the old one as you for a bit. Almost every day one may hear of similar cases which show the power of superstitious fears over weak minds. Midsummer Bonfires Our bonfires, torches, and tar barrels, with the peculiar hand-in-hand -hand dance around the blazing piles, remind us of ancient times when similar customs were regarded as sacred rites by our forefathers. And it would seem as if some vestiges of these time-honored religious notions were still connected with midsummer bonfires in the minds of old-fashioned people, living in remote and primitive districts. Where they still believe that dancing in a ring over the embers, around a bonfire, or leaping, singly, through its flames is calculated to ensure good luck to the performers and to serve as a protection from witchcraft and other malign influences during the ensuing year. Many years ago, on Midsummer's Eve, when it became dusk, very old people in the West Country would hobble away to some high ground, whence they obtained a view of the most prominent hills, such as Bardney, Chapel Carnbrea, Sankers Bicken, Castle and Dinas, Carn Galver, St. Agnes Bicken, and many other beacon hills far away to north and east, which vied with each other in their midsummer's blaze. They counted the fires and drew a presage from the number of them. There are now but few bonfires to be seen on the western heights, yet we have observed that Tregonan, Godolphin, and Carnmarth hills, with others away towards Ridruth, still retain their ball fires. We would gladly go many miles to see the weird-looking, yet picturesque, dancers around the flames on a cam, or high hill top, as we have seen them some forty years ago. We are sorry to find that another pleasing midsummer's observance, which also appears to be ancient, has almost died out. Yet within the memory of many, who would not like to be called old or even aged, on a midsummer's eve long before sunset, groups of girls, both gentle and simple, of from ten to twenty years of age, neatly dressed and decked with garlands, wreaths or chaplets of flowers, would be seen dancing in the streets. One favorite mode of adornment was to sew, or pin, on the skirt of a white dress, rows of laurel leaves, often spangled with gold leaf. 
Before midsummer small wooden hoops were in great demand to be wreathed with green boughs and flowed for garlands, to be worn over one shoulder and under the opposite arm. Toward sunset groups of graceful damsels, joined by their brothers, friends, or lovers, would be seen, threading the needle, playing at, kiss in the ring, or simply dancing along every here and there from Kyandur to Alverton. From the quay to Conshead, as the upper part of the town used then to be called, perhaps with more propriety than Causeway Head. The Mermaid of Zener Zener folks tell the following story, which, according to them, accounts for a singular carving on a bench end in their church. Hundreds of years ago a very beautiful and richly attired lady attended service in Zener church occasionally, now and then she went to Morva also, her visits were by no means regular, often long intervals would elapse between them. Yet whenever she came the people were enchanted with her good looks and sweet singing. Although Zener folks were remarkable for their fine psalmody, she excelled them all. And they wondered how, after the scores of years that they had seen her, she continued to look so young and fair. No one knew whence she came nor whither she went, yet many watched her as far as they could see from Tregarthen Hill. She took some notice of a fine young man, called Mathie Truella, who was the best singer in the parish. He once followed her, but he never returned. After that she was never more seen in Zenner Church, and it might not have been known to this day who or what she was but for the merest accident. One Sunday morning a vessel cast anchor about a mile from Pendower Cove. Soon after a mermaid came close alongside and hailed the ship. Rising out of the water as far as her waist, with her yellow hair floating around her, she told the captain that she was returning from church, and requested him to trip his anchor just for a minute. As the fluke of it rested on the door of her dwelling, and she was anxious to get in to her children. Others say that while she was out on the ocean a fishing of a Sunday morning, the anchor was dropped on the trap door which gave access to her submarine abode. Finding, on her return, how she was hindered from opening her door, she begged the captain to have the anchor raised that she might enter her dwelling to dress her children and be ready in time for church. However it may be, her polite request had a magical effect upon the sailors, for they immediately, worked with a will, hove anchor and set sail, not wishing to remain a moment longer than they could help near her habitation. Seafaring men, who understood most about mermaids, regarded their appearance as a token that bad luck was near at hand. It was believed they could take such shapes as suited their purpose, and that they had often allured men to live with them. When Zener folks learnt that a mermaid dwelt near Pendower, and what she had told the captain, they concluded, it was, this sea lady who had visited their church, and enticed Truella to her abode. To commemorate these somewhat unusual events they had the figure she bore, when in her ocean home, carved in holy oak, which may still be seen. Glossary of Local Words A or A H, he or it, e g a e s, it is. After winding, waste corn. And, ant, an expression of regard applied to aged women. Arir, Maria P., an exclamation of angry surprise. Arish, stubble. Biel, a mine. Banal, broom plant. Bauji, sheepfold, and k, on cliff or downs. Brave, much, very well, and k. Bruyans, crumbs. Buka, a spirit. Bukabio, dhu, a black spirit. Bullhorn, a large shell snail. Busa, an earthen crock. Busy, to be, to require. E.g. it is busy all, it requires all. Cons, pavement. Cater, a coarse sieve for winnowing. Ch. Word used for calling swine. Child vn, little child, a term of endearment. Chill, an iron lamp. Cliff, all the ground between the shore and cultivated land. The cliff proper, or precipice, is called the edge of the cliff, the cleaves, or the carns. Clunk, to swallow. Costin, a basket made of straw and brambles. Courant, romping play. Corsi, to linger gossiping. Cowall, a large fish basket. Cravel, mantle stone. Crellas, the ruins of ancient beehive huts, an excavation in a bank, roofed over to serve for an outhouse, and k. 
Krogan, a limpet shell. Kronak, a toad. Sirayudi, the rind of a sieve covered a with sheepskin, used for taking up corn, and, also an old fiddle. Crumb, crooked. Kraust, afternoon's refreshment of bread and beer in harvest time. Crow, a small outhouse. Digin, a little bit. Digby, a very small homestead. Dower, water. Drukshar, a small solid wheel. Duffin, a nickname for one much given to self-laudation. Usually bestowed on a bouncing religionist who is powerful in speech, and strong in faith, but no better than ordinary mortals in works. Duffy, a forthright, blunt happy-go-lucky person. Dumbledore, large black beetle. E, ye or you. Fakes. Faith. Flush it, a floodgate. Fuggin, a small unleavened cake. Fuggo, an artificial cave. Gajvraz, the ox eye daisy. Guard, soil used for scouring. Garrick, a rook. Glows, dried cow dung used for fuel. Grambler, a stony place. Griglins, heath. Gruit, fine soil. Gare, play, called out by boys when they throw quoits cast a ball, and k. Guys dance, Christmas mummery. Gulf eyes, in silly nickelthies, harvest home feast. Gurgos, the ruins of ancient fences found on waste land. Gweben, a periwinkle. Hilla, the nightmare. Hagen, a fuggen with meat baked on it, the fruit of hawthorns. Kegas, rank wild plants, such as water hemlock, elecampane, and k. Kibble, a bucket used at a draw well or mine shaft. Kiskis, the dried up stalks of keg gas. Knackers, knockers, spirits in the mines. Cuny, moss, lichen, and k. Lamer, the yellow water iris. LEW, sheltered from wind. LEWTH, shelter. Mabier, a young hen. Mirion, an ant. MOR, the root, produce roots. More work, tin streaming. Morabs, land near the sea. Nakan, a kerchief. OR weed, seaweed. Organ, penny royal. Padspaw, a newt. Par, cove. The word porth is never used by the natives of West Cornwall, nor does it ever occur in family names. Peath, a draw well. Piggle, a kind of large hoe used for cutting turf, and k. PLF, woolly dust. Piljack, a poor scurvy fellow. Piskey, a mischievous fairy that delights to lead people astray, also a greenish bug, found on blackberries. Pitch to, to set to work with good heart. Plum, soft, light. Porvin, a rush lamp wick. Pruitt. A word used for calling cows. Pul, mire, mud. Poolin, a small pool, such as is left by ebb tide. Pul Kronach, a small toad-like fish, found in poolins. Quok, a heavy fall. Quilkin, a frog. Quillet, a small field. Ariane, a steep hillside. Rose, low-lying level ground, more land, and k. R-U-L-L-S, rolls of carded wool. S-E-W, gone to, dried up. S-K-A-W, the elder tree. S-K-A-W dower, fig wort. Skedgewith, privet. Small people, fairies. S-O-S, lose, forsooth. Spanish Dumbledore, the cockchaffer. Spriggan, sprite, fairy. Sproul, life, energy. Steroith, more haste than good speed. Stroll, an untidy mess. Talfet, a boarded floor, for a bedplace. Over one end of a cottage. Threshel, a flail. Tozar, a large apron or wrapper. Turban, a clod of earth. Tubble, a mattock. Tumbles, quantity. Tinctavis, a tattling fool. Tuntry, the pole by which oxen draw a wain, cart, and k. 
turn, a spinning wheel. Uncle, a term of regard given to an old man. Vn, little. Vind, moldy. Visci, a pickaxe. Visnen, the sand lawns. Vow, a cavern, or fuggo. Vug, a cavity in a load or rock. Widden, small. Widdens, small fields. Wsst, sad, like a person or thing ill wished. Zawn, pro sown, a cavern in a cliff. A short time ago, two gentlemen of Penzance walked over to Chisoster, the higher side of Gulvau, on a Sunday morning, to inspect the hut circles, caves, and other remains of what are supposed to have been ancient British habitations. After a fruitless search, the gentlemen returned towards Chisoster to see if they could meet with anyone to inform them where the objects they were in quest of might be found. In the lane they overtook a woman and asked her if she knew of any caves thereabout. Caves? No, I don't, not fit for butchers, she replied, but if you want any for Rieran I think I can tell E where there is some to be found. Now I look at E Egan you don't seem much like butchers nether, nor you aren't none of our farmers about here either. Where are E Coleman from at all? Looking for caves of a Sunday mornan. You are very much in want of them I suppose. The gentleman explained that they neither wanted calves for rearing nor killing, but to find the ancient ruins. Oh Lord, said she, you're looking for the old crellas, and things up in the hill. Why didn't ye say so then, that one might know what you meant, instead of givan such outlandish names to things. But come ye along with me, and I'll show ye, continued she in turning back and leading the way.